Today, we're going to look at installing the Magic Multitasking Operating System. Here it is in all of its glory. 16 color glory anyway. Magic C offers quite a lot of a standard TOS. It offers up to 64 open windows simultaneously. It runs TOS apps in Windows. It has custom font and file selectors. It claims to be and is provably faster than TOS. It can handle system fonts that are proportional fonts. It has a notion of shared libraries. So for example, the file and the font selector have shared libraries. So if both of them are open at the same time, there's only one copy of that library code in memory. It is compatible with Windows 95 or VFAT type hard drives with long file names. It has logging of boot text in a file, which is handy for testing things. And it implements a lot of OS goodies like threads, signals, semaphores, etc. And of course, it's a fully fledged preemptive multitasking operating system. Now, previously, I've covered the two types of multitasking operating systems, but let's just run over it now so that we have cooperative multitasking where applications yield control of the CPU back to the operating system to allow it to schedule other processes. And we saw this in the Genie OS, actually, where applications did that yielding of the thread, if you like, when they made certain system calls. Preemptive multitasking, on the other hand, schedules apps to run for certain time periods called a slice or a quantum. And then at the end of that time period, they yank the CPU away and schedule it to run some other process. So with preemptive multitasking, there should never arise a situation where a, a rogue process hogs the CPU, preventing other apps from executing. But what I did find funny, or I do find funny, is that the Manual of Geneva says it's faster and better because it doesn't use preemption. And Magic says it's better because it does. Now, in all of this, it's to be borne in mind that the, the daddy of all multitasking systems for Atari's is Mint. And I'll have a link to a video about Mint up there on the right. Now, one area where Magic wins over Mint, hands down, is in memory consumption. And we'll see that a little bit later. So the configuration for Hatari that we're going to be using for this install is different from usual. We're moving away from Emutos and we're going to use an kind of inverted commas of real TOS ROM. Obviously, if you're in real hardware, you'll have your TOS ROM already. The bad news is that if your real machine is a TT or a Falcon, there are some things in this guide that you're going to have to do differently. On those systems, you will need a different hard drive driver. So we're running a system here that is an Atari ST with TOS 2.06. The CPU is a stock 68,000 running at 8 megahertz. Memory is maxed out for real hardware at 4 megabytes, but that's still a very common configuration. I have two machines with that sat downstairs. In my floppy drive, I've inserted a floppy with ICD Pro, which is what we're going to use for our hard disk driver. For a hard drive, we have a single unformatted 512 meg image. I created that using DD, as we've done in several previous videos. There may be a link to that above too. Finally, my video is configured as RGB, and we're going to be using medium res graphics throughout. Most of this configuration is because we're going to be booting our drive using ICD Pro, and that tooling is very fussy about its application execution environment. For example, if you run it on a 68040, it will just crash. It's something about more posh architectures that it cannot handle. Right, let's get to format. All we need to do is a reboot and make sure we boot from the A drive, and that's going to load the ICD Pro driver from the auto folder and everything will be ready. I'm performing a cold reboot. So we're going to see the Atari logo because we're on a real ROM. And we're going to skip the memory test because emulators don't get faulty memory. Now, there is a way to disable that memory check under Atari, and I'll cover that in my next Hatari video where I'm going to cover some slightly more advanced features, shall we say. So as you can see, it's booting from the A drive and we see the ICD Pro banner and it's found our emulated hard drive and it outputs its current settings. Let's open the floppy drive and we're going to find the ICD format application. Then we're going to run that. Again, if you, if you watch my videos, this will be familiar to you. We used this in the previous video on how to use the EXT2 file system on Mint. Again, links above, perhaps. So ICD Pro is a decent hard disk driver. There are other ones I'd prefer to use here. I mean, I have a license for Peter Putnik's driver, or, you know, you might want to use the HD driver suite. But if I'm going to make this hard drive image available online, as I usually do, I cannot use either of those two because they are commercial products. So we only have one drive, so let's select that. And now it's going to scan for SCSI drives, of which, of course, there are none. And I've said this before, and I'm going to say it again. The most important option on this next screen is to set the verify passes to zero. Otherwise, it'll check every sector on a 512 megabyte hard drive to see if it's bad or not. And that does take hours and hours we don't need to waste because there are no bad sectors on a blank emulated disk. So after clicking partition and the UI initializing, 
we see the standard suggested list of 17 small partitions. So I'm going to clear that list and we're going to split the disk into two partitions. Pretty arbitrarily, I'm going to set my first partition to 128 meg and the second to 408. And then I click recalculate and it says I've got, well, I've basically left 0.87 megabytes on the cutting room floor. And I think I can live with that. And in no time at all, it's done. So we click out the app and that will force a reboot. Now at this point, we're still booting from the floppy because we haven't installed the ICD Pro driver on the disk. It's found our two partitions, so things are moving in the right direction. Opening the floppy, we need to run the HDUtil app to install the driver on the C drive. Now, there is an app here called install.prg that will perform the two parts of what we're doing here using ICD format and HDUtil in one go. But it implies the defaults as it goes, and that means 17 very small drives, which is wholly not what I want. I mean, it's really meant for novice users, not pros like us. So let's run HDUtil. By the way, this is one of those sensitive apps I mentioned where if you, if you don't run it as stock configuration, it will give you a bus error. So if you see a bus error when you run it, double check you're on a 68,000 CPU at around about 8 megahertz. To install the driver, we click the boot button. We make sure C is selected and then OK that. We click on OK to use the ICD boot.prg driver. And then we quit out of that app. OK, let's install our devices. Hmm. That's kind of confusing, isn't it? But don't worry, that'll go away under magic. So opening the real C drive, we see a single file called icdboot.sys. That's our hard disk driver, and that will be picked up during the boot process. Now I'm going to clean up the desktop, and since we now have a hard drive to save it to, I'm going to save it. When we boot, it'll be less confusing. Before we boot, I'm going to eject the floppy, and we'll reboot from C. So the F drive here that we're seeing in uh, under the... TOSROM contains all of the software that we want to install in this episode. It's a GemDOS folder, so Hatari's handling it. That hard drive folder will not be available under Magic. So I'll copy the contents of that drive into a temporary folder called install on my D drive. So I'm going to copy Magic, NVDI, and Xboot across to the install folder. Obviously, I'm speeding this up massively because there's quite a bit to copy. And in the root of the D drive, I'm going to create a folder called bin, and that's going to have all of my non-system specific applications in this particular configuration. And into that, I'm going to copy some of my favorite gem apps. Again, massively sped up. Right, time to install Magic. So these are the files that I downloaded from Magic, and these are from the Abandonware page at the Tory forum. There's a link in the description of that page. And I mean, you know, thanks to the forum members for maintaining these over the years. I mean, it's, it's an invaluable resource, that page. So disk one is the installer. Disk two are some extra tools and utilities. The Falk UK folder contains a patched magic image for the Atari Falcon. And the UK patch contains English language resources just for the magic desktop in general. Running the installer. We enter our details and then we install it. And I'm going to fast forward this as usual. And I think at the end there it just said it can't find the README. But we installed what we wanted to. And looking in the C drive, we have an auto folder with the MagX boot program. And in the root, we have our Gemsys folder, our control panel extensions folder, and magic.ram, which is our magic kernel. So it's time for a cold reboot. And to see what we get. Right, so we're seeing the ICD boot splash. And if I pause it really carefully, you'll see the magic C booter. And then as we roll through this, the hard drive initializes again. And I think you can tell at this point, Magic is hooking into the bootstrap process at a very, very low level. And I think this is why installing on plain EMUTOS hard drives just doesn't seem to work. If you do install it just on a blank disk, you'll get an error message saying it can't find the off screen buffer or something like that. So the fix is to do everything on TOS. You can actually swap to EMUTOS later on, by the way, you can do that. So here we are in the Magic Desktop. So let's apply that language pack, shall we? So notice how we no longer have access to the GemDOS folder, and that's why we copied the files onto D. So if we go into D, install Magic UK patch, this contains a folder hierarchy matching the hierarchy on the C drive. So we just copy the files from this folder into the root of C, and we select 
what my phone confidently tells me is overwrite. Now we just go for it. Now the progress bar looks nice, if a little wonky. When we swap to mono mode later, it actually looks really good. So let's shut down. And notice here, unlike in other desktops, it's got a really nice built-in shutdown system. So we get a nice dialogue. Let's choose cold boot. Back on the desktop, let's have a look at what memory is being consumed by Magic, the OS and its desktop. And it's saying we had four meg to start with and we have 2,969 left spare. So it's consuming just a tickle over a meg of memory in total. And I mean, to me, that's pretty impressive. The very, very last version of Mint can't even boot in four meg. And this has three meg spare, it's good. So I've run a benchmark to get a baseline for Magic at this point, and then we're going to compare it with some results later. So next, we're going to install NVDI to speed things up. And I'm just showing this footage as flavor. I covered NVDI and its performance in very, very great detail in the video currently showing at the top right of your screen. So let's zip through installing NVDI. So post the install of NVDI, I ran a second set of benchmarks and looking at the comparison between them, we see that the baseline is our previous benchmark, that's pre-NVDI, and the results with NVDI are shown in green. And for this chart, shorter bars are better. Now it wasn't a complete victory for NVDI over stock magic. It's interesting to note. So looking at the results, the gem dialog box test under NVDI were 68% better than baseline. VDI text was 38% better than base, which is pretty incredible. VDI text, 60%, again, good. Gem window was 82% of stock and VDI inquire was 86% of baseline. Then there were three tests that were close to identical or identical. So VDI scroll at 100%, VDI small text at 101% and justified text at 102%. Okay, slightly worse than stock in some of those situations, but pretty close to the margin of error for Gembench, to be honest, so you will call them equal. However, one test stands out and that's VDI graphics, where NVDI underperformed at 116% of baseline. Now, I don't really have an explanation for that, so I'm going to hit the manuals for both Magic and NVDI 5, and then I'll see what I can find and I'll get back to you in a future video. But overall, NVDI improves the performance of an already impressive system. And here I am running some eye candy to show off its multitasking abilities. And this proves that it's good. Also, bear in mind, this is a 68,000 CPU running at 8 megahertz. I mean, that's amazing. I've said amazing too much, haven't I? Right. I'm going to swap to mono mode and give you a quick feature tour of the Magic Desktop. Now, this isn't an entry for my Battle of the Desktop series. It's kind of a bit of a lightweight competitor. But two things struck me looking at this, and they are, one, they certainly seem to have seen a Mac when designing this, I'm telling you. And two, with those desk icons over there, it reminds me of the granddaddy of all the Atari desktop replacements, which was Gemini. As usual, we'll tour the desktop and look at the Windows features and then hit the menus. So there are no toolbars on the Windows. Clicking the title bar shows you the amount of free space on the drive. I have a cycle Windows button here in the title bar, which is always a welcome feature. And very usefully, we have an option to minimize and maximize Windows. Also, double clicking on the title bar of a window rolls it up to show what's underneath. And these two features stack, so you can roll up and minimize. For navigation, it uses the dot dot button here to go up a level and the button on the left top of the window becomes a closed button. I'm not a fan of that metaphor. I've spent way too long on Atari's that use that button as an up level button. So I keep closing folders by mistake and it's kind of frustrating. I mean, I could get used to it if that was all I had, but yeah, prefer not. The last Windows decoration is resize and that's bottom right only on this desktop. That's it for Windows and stuff like that. So let's have a poke around the file menu. So we can change the font, should we so wish. And well, while that works, not that font, please. In text mode, it's showing name and size. And there are the usual other options of date and time also. Now, one thing we usually check at this point is how does it handle resize in text mode? And the answer is really well. It only goes to two columns when there is enough screen space to actually show all of the details of the file name. And there's also an option to force display as a single column, which is also good. And we can sort by the usual criteria of 
name, size, date, etc., including unsorted. And usually, when I talk about unsorted, I mention the order of items in the auto folder. But for magic, I'm going to defer talking about that until the next episode, because it's somewhat slightly different in magic, and I'd like to actually be able to spend some time on it beyond this video. So let's swap over to icon mode. And if I haven't mentioned it already, nice selection of icons. So the options menu has the usual toss fare. If you like, you can install devices and there's preferences. As usual, I'll step quickly through the options and you can pause the video to look at them in detail if you wish. Now, it's not that there's actually that many. I mean, compared to the preferences in, say, Genie, there's hardly any. We have a resolution change dialog, but we're in mono mode, so it's not that useful for us. You can save your options. Shutdown is implemented in Magic very smoothly, as we've already seen. No need to show that again. The objects menu allow you to jump to any open desktop, and you can also add applications or files to the menu and then have the default application performed on them when they're selected. So as you can see, I've put assign.sys in there, and when you select it, it opens it in the default file viewer, and the default file viewer is pretty good in Magic. So around about now, I'd normally talk about icon editing and assignment. However, I'm gonna give that a miss as my magic system has the genie desktop in its future so there's no point really going over that now i haven't used magic much over the years but it's going under at least one of my physical machines today because honestly i think it's the best bang for my book in terms of speed and features for sts stfms stes especially when they're limited to four megabytes of memory and while it doesn't have perfect backwards compatibility especially for games that's not something that really worries me but that's all for now Thanks for watching, and I will talk to you soon. Before we reboot, though, I'm going to inject the floppy. Inject? Before we reboot, I'm going to...